Oh, um, another Jamo speaker. It's not like I go out and I find speakers that are bad on purpose so I can trash them. I don't want to do that. In fact, the reason I purchased these speakers myself for 300 bucks for the pair, brand new in box, is because I was hoping that they would be good and that would be just one more budget speaker that I could point to and say, hey, there's something you might want to try. But this speaker is not it. In many ways, really what you're paying for here is the look. The Jamo S803 that I reviewed earlier this week, which you can find in the description below, I'll have it down there. It's 150 bucks for the pair and it's a really, really bad speaker. It's just very resonant and boomy in the mid bass area and the high frequency is very much overbearing. This speaker is double the price and the only thing that it really does better is it doesn't have boomy mid bass. The high frequency is taken down by just a notch. And I mean, just a notch, it's not really much, but in the grand scheme of things, it's still about three to four dB higher than the mid range. And if you don't understand what that means, I'm gonna play you a clip of music, and then I'm going to play that same clip of music equalized to the response of these speakers. The idea for a speaker is to reproduce the sound as faithfully as it can to the original recording. So anything that you hear that's different from the original recording that I'm gonna play you first, is incorrect. I mean, truthfully, it's incorrect. Now, whether you like that or not, that's a separate topic. But let me play this clip for you. I'm gonna to toggle back and forth between the original and then the C93-2, back and forth for about a minute and just pay attention, see what you hear. Then we're gonna come back and talk about it. In my listening sessions, what I mainly took away was that the high frequency is just too bright, harsh, fatiguing. Now, subjectively speaking, you may prefer that kind of sound. I certainly don't. I want a speaker that is neutral, and the objective data shows us that this speaker is actually not neutral. We're going to talk about that shortly. If you think I'm a Jamo hater, that's really not the truth. There is a subwoofer that I reviewed about a year ago from Jamo. It's a 12-inch. can't remember the, uh, the exact model number for it, but I actually liked it. So it's not Jamo hate. This is hate of a speaker that performs very non-accurately. And when I talk about accuracy, it's very simple. If you take a sound and you record that sound and then you play it back over a speaker, you hope that you're gonna get that same sound. Well, this speaker is gonna take that sound and it's gonna elevate the treble by about three to four dB. And that's gonna be what you heard in that sound clip that I previously played. So let's just talk about the data. I think that'll make things a little bit easier and help you understand where I'm coming from. Now my data is collected using the Klippel Near Field Scanner. It is a robotic device that sits in my garage. It scans a speaker 360 degrees all around and it maps out the frequency response at different ranges, whatever I tell it to, it'll do. We're gonna start off with the CEA 2034 specification. And if you're unfamiliar with what this means, I've got a whole series of videos that explains what the data is, and that allows me to kind of blow through this a little bit more quickly, but I will hit the finer points. If you wanna check out that playlist of videos, make sure you click the link in the description below. I've gone ahead and made some notes here in this data. Average sensitivity is about 84 dB. Look at the mid range compared to the high frequency. On average, the high frequency is about five dB above the mid range. Beyond that, however, if you just look, look how non-linear this upper frequency is. At some points, it's about even with the mid range, which really is only around like one kilohertz. Then around what, three kilohertz, but at two kilohertz, you're about plus three dB at, what is this, about eight, six or eight or so, you're anywhere from four to five dB, and then at about 12 kilohertz, you're about six dB over the mid range. So it's just bouncing all over the place. That's gonna really mess with the overall timbre. Not only do you have to worry about the mid-range sounding softer and level, but now the high frequency is gonna accentuate things that it shouldn't accentuate, or it's gonna soften things that it shouldn't soften. 
ideally you would have just a flat line right through here. Now, not all speakers are going to do that and do that well. So it's okay if it's not perfect, but this speaker is far, far from perfect. And it's going to have a lot of discontinuity in the overall timbre and the accuracy of the sound. The other aspect to pay attention to is the ERDI. Notice how it's increasing. And if it had continued to keep going straight through here, you would have probably been okay. You could EQ the speaker. It would have just been narrower and narrower in radiation. But the problem comes into play through this two kilohertz area right here that looks like there's some kind of diffraction going on here, probably from the enclosure. And then there's another diffraction effect right around here that's probably from the waveguide. Here we have the estimated in-room response, and this is a good idea of what the speaker is going to sound like in your room. I've drawn a trend line through the mid-range, and as you can see, I've drawn a box around the bass area. So that's going to sound maybe a little bit punchy. It may actually sound good to you. It's not super resonant, but there is some resonance that's detectable in that region. But my main area of concern is the high frequency. Again, it's kind of the same story where it's lifted about three to five dB, depending on where you're looking at, but it's also very uneven and you cannot equalize this to smooth that out. So it's going to be a very fatiguing sound after a short period of time. One big issue you run into with speakers, especially budget speakers, is that the crossovers are not designed well. The mid-range is not designed to hand off to the tweeter in an acceptable fashion. So what happens is the mid-range is narrowing up in dispersion. It's sending less and less information out to the side walls so you have less reflection, which you may think is a good thing. But then all of a sudden, here comes the tweeter and it blows that all up because the tweeter is super wide again. Now what you want is you want to match the dispersion of the mid-woofer to the tweeter. You want those to line up and you want those to smoothly blend together and any kind of discontinuity in between those areas is going to create an issue with soundstage placement, images in the soundstage. Because at one frequency, they may be here, and another frequency, it may be over here. That's not good. This speaker exhibits those kind of issues. So what I've drawn here is a line to kind of give you an idea. So through the mid-range, the speaker is narrowing up, and it's about plus or minus 30 degrees. But then in the high frequency, you bounce out to as much as plus or minus 60 degrees. So there's a pretty big difference between the radiation pattern of the speaker between the mid frequency and the high frequency. So high frequencies may actually sound wider than the mid frequencies. That may sound cool, but think about that for a second. If somebody plays a snare and they smack that sucker, do you want to hear it in one spot or do you want to hear it here and over here at the same time? I'm assuming you probably don't want to hear it in two different places. You want that image precision. Image precision comes from number of things, but mainly crossover implementation. And this crossover is not implemented well. In terms of vertical dispersion, like where you want to put your ear relative to the tweeter, put it right on the tweeter axis if you do buy these speakers. Now, this graphic is the one that should seal the deal. If you if you were like, okay, I don't care about the linearity, this is the one that should make you go, I'm out. Peace. The compression. Compression is when you're playing at a low volume and then you're playing at a high volume all of a sudden, how well does that speaker track? Can it go this to this, or does it go this to this? Think of it like this. If you're listening to a track at 76 decibels, you're just kind of cruising in your music, you know, like just listening to your music, you're enjoying it, and then all of a sudden there's a large transient. Like take the snare, for example. The snare smacks, right? And if it's a good dynamic range track, you should go pow, pow, like it's kind of cool. It gives that snap to it. Compression is when all the snap is just chopped off. So anything that was going to go up to here, you just came in and you chopped it. Speaker said, I can't do above this, so I'm not playing anything through here. I'm just chopping it right here. You're not going to hear the full extent of the dynamicism of the track that you're listening to. That's what compression is. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is this speaker suffers high, high compression, and it's probably the worst I've seen out of any speaker that didn't feature a limiter at this high output. Another thing you may be thinking is, well, you're saying 102 dB. This is 102 dB at one meter anechoic with no reflections from a room. When you put this into a room at about four meters away with a pair of speakers, it's going to be about 92 dB. If you're listening to music at about 80 decibels, do you have a track that has good dynamic range? If you say yes, then you probably have about, let's just say 12 dB of dynamic range. This speaker in the bass is gonna take at least three dB off of that. You're not gonna get the full extent. So at most, the dynamic range that you need to get from 80 decibels to 92 decibels, 
is going to be cut off by 3 dB, you're going to top out at 89 decibels. You're not going to get the full extent of the dynamics of that track when you're listening to this speaker. If this were like 1 dB or maybe 2 dB, I might be more willing to forgive the speaker. But when you're talking about compression that goes literally off the chart, I don't even know where this goes. It could go down to 4, 5, 6. I don't know. But it's significant. Multitone distortion is a way to emulate real music for distortion testing. It's not just one tone, it's like a whole bunch of tones at one time and it's almost like pink noise. Negative 20 dB is 10% distortion. And that's what I've drawn here in this trend line right through here. Now, personally speaking, I use the negative 20 dB marker as a point where I say, all right, this is getting bad. This speaker runs through that 20 dB area from 200 Hertz to about 1.2 kilohertz. So basically the entire mid range is running through that 20 dB area. That's high distortion. You're going to hear that as a very grainy sound. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please see the card up here. I have an entire video on multi-tone distortion and why it matters and what it sounds like. At these lower volumes, the multi-tone distortion is acceptable. I'm okay with that. But at the higher volume, that's when you're running into issues and that's very analogous to the compression that we saw as well. For what it's worth, I'll also measure the speaker with the grill on. Here's the trend line, but you can see just how non-linear the speaker becomes when the grill is on. So you're better off listening to the speaker with the grill off. If after watching all of this, you're thinking, okay, well, what can I get for $300? You know, I don't wanna get a $150 speaker because I know they're not that great, but I can't spend $500. So what can I get in between? The Emotiva B1 Plus. This speaker right here, this is what you get for $250. Buy the speaker set, save $50 over the Jamo C93 II. Why do I say that? Well, I'm not gonna get into what I heard, but I'll tell you that I actually like the B1 Plus a lot. Here's the frequency response of the speaker. Now compare this back to the Jamo. See how different they are? Now we're back to the B1 Plus again. Two things I wanna point out about this set. The on-axis response is much more linear. The sensitivity is roughly the same. It's about 84 or 85 dB or so. The only thing that really bothered me when I listened to the speaker was this resonance right through here, but you can equalize that out if you want to. Why do I say that? Well, if we go down here and look, the early reflections directivity index is pretty smooth. So this area right here is equalizable. This particular area right through here, not so much equalizable, but it still takes better to EQ by far than the C93. And then if we look at the estimated interim response, I'm gonna show you the C93 again with the trend line, and now the Emotiva B1 Plus with the trend line. See how much more smooth the B1 Plus is? It follows the trend very well. It's a much more linear speaker. It's gonna sound much more accurate by far than the C93 Jamo speaker. I was tempted a number of times just to throw in the towel and say, look, C93 II, don't buy it, buy the Emotiva B1 Plus if you're looking for a speaker in this ballpark price and be done with it. Like that was really where I was at with this video. But then I thought about it some more and I thought, you know, it would help if people understood why I don't like the speaker and why I say it's a non-neutral speaker and provide them the actual factual information because there's gonna be a lot of you out there who maybe own these speakers or maybe have heard them and you disagree with my assessment. That's fine. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what my data is for because I can back it up quantitatively. Quantitatively? Quantitative? Whatever. I can back that information up with evidence. The job, job for me is to explain that in a way that helps you. And I really and truly hope that these reviews are helpful to you. If you've heard the speaker and you didn't like it, hey, now you probably have a good understanding of why. If you heard the speaker and you do like it, hey, now you probably have a good understanding of why. You can relate these things. I like the high frequency or I don't like the high frequency boost. Okay, but now you know. Um, with that said, I also wanna note that when I order speakers to review, I don't buy them with the intent to send them back. This speaker's going back. Normally what I do is I'll buy speakers and then I'll sell them at a loss. And it's, I'm not crying. This isn't woe is me. I'm just like, this is what I do. I'll sell them at a loss. I'll maybe take $100, $200 off if I can. And I, I do that with the budget speakers. The stuff that's like a 500 bucks and beyond, there's just no way. I can't afford that stuff. And I can't afford to take a $500 loss on, on a set of speakers. That's just, I'm just not doing that. But with bookshelf speakers and stuff like that, yeah, I, uh, here and there, it's okay because I have your support. My patrons who are out there, you guys are the ones who, and girls, uh, are the ones who make this happen, truthfully. 
those of you who use my affiliate links, whether it's an affiliate link for a direct product or just a generic one, that enables this to happen. Those of you who donate via PayPal, that enables this to happen. And when I turn around and sell a speaker, I mean, that's part of the process. But I want to be clear and transparent that I'll order these speakers with the intent to sell them to a patron or something like that. These speakers are going back. So if you wind up getting speakers that had the exact same serial number as these, now you know why. If you like what I do and you like what I'm what I'm doing here, please support the best way you can. Uh, share with your friends, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, hit the notifications bell, all that cool stuff, <clears throat> because that, that's a big help trying to spread the word. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.